Hello and welcome to the newsroom for today, Monday, May 10, 2021. We're broadcasting to you on E1, Scar TV, NTN and Tarzi TV in Barteca. These are the headlines. Guyana gets over 38,000 AstraZeneca vaccines through the Global Vaccine Alliance. We want to encourage people to take the vaccine. Don't read the social media, take it from the experts. An Essequibo man kills his brother with a rum bottle as Mother's Day celebrations turn ugly. Minister Edgell defends the destruction of mangroves to make way for a shore base on the west bank of Damarara, but says an alternative measure to prevent flooding is already in place. The big picture is that there will always be a give and take situation. From no meals to victory on UFC debut, Carlston Harris shares how he overcame hardships to succeed and hear how a woman's post-pregnancy weight inspired her fitness journey. With the news, I'm Neil Marks. We're glad you could join us. Guyana on Monday received another 38,400 doses of Oxford's AstraZeneca vaccine through the global initiative called the COVAX facility. The consignment of AstraZeneca is the second to arrive in Guyana from COVAX. The first shipment of 24,000 doses arrived on March 29th. The vaccines arrived at the Chedi Jagan International Airport and was received by Minister of Foreign Affairs and International Cooperation Hugh Todd on behalf of the government of Guyana. The vaccines were shipped by PAHO's Revolving Fund, which is responsible for the procurement of COVID-19 vaccines for the countries of the Americas under the COVAX facility. With more vaccines expected to arrive successively during this year, Guyana is expected to continue receiving doses until it reaches 100,800 under the COVAX facility. Guyana is one of 10 countries in Latin America and the Caribbean that are receiving vaccines at no cost through the COVAX advanced market commitment. Guyana is the first country in the mechanism to receive the vaccines from the Caribbean through COVAX. COVAX seeks to provide vaccines for at least 20% of the population of each participating country during this year. In this first round of vaccine allocation, all COVAX participating countries will receive doses to vaccinate between 2.2 and 2.6% of their population. Guyana had also received doses of the AstraZeneca from India and also currently has the Sinopharm and Sputnik V vaccines, which are also being administered simultaneously. I'm more than delighted to be here today with uh, my colleagues from the other missions and uh, the Honourable Foreign Minister today on this wonderful, wonderful occasion. The UK has pledged £548 million to the COVAX vaccine rollout initiative, making it one of the largest donors. And uh, for that, I am really pleased to be able to, to represent the UK on this. I would reiterate a couple of things my colleagues have said. Um, one, the government of Guyana have been extraordinary. extraordinary in this rollout. Uh, vaccine take up has been high, but it should be higher. What uh, I would encourage, as my EU colleague said, we want to encourage people to take the vaccine. Don't read the social media, take it from the experts. Take the vaccine. It does save lives. So that's an important message that I really want to get across to you today. We want to say a heartfelt thank you to our international friends and partners who would have made the COVAX mechanism um, very effective in being able to treat with uh, this global pandemic. As we are aware, we've seen uh, the effects of this pandemic and we are certain that we live in a global village. This threat to the global health of citizens throughout the world required a global governance approach. And this is what you get when countries come together, I'm recognizing that we need to uh, put our time and energies together to ensure that we can um, fix a problem that has um, global repercussions. Um, we need to have a healthy uh, global environment for us to enjoy um, good health um, and, and long health. And we have to um, give um, credence to um, this mechanism. I think Guyana on the leadership of the president, we have been very, very proactive. We've been, um, we were doing our research. We were able to balance public policy with the science. We kept doing our research. The Minister of Health, um, I can tell you, has been very involved in following the literature 
um, advising cabinet and the president, and we were able um, to find that balance to keep our economy going at the same time. And with the assistance we're getting through the COVAX mechanism, um, augurs quite well for Guyana. We remain committed um, to multilateralism, and we want to continue um, along this trend. We see this as an important uh, lesson being learned uh, globally. The removal of mangroves by TriStar Inc. at Malgatut, Versailles, West Bank, Demerara is necessary to set up a shore base, but mitigating measures have already been put in place to prevent flooding, Minister of Public Works Juan Edgel said Monday afternoon. Edgel said the removal of the mangroves was necessary to support the new wave of development initiated by the discovery of significant amounts of oil and gas offshore Guyana. During a press conference at his White Slane Kingston Georgetown office, Edgel, in defense of the development, said the mangroves were cleared after all necessary processes were followed. He also assured that hard structures have already been installed to guard against flooding in the absence of the mangroves in that area. Starting from here, just behind me, where the Coast Guard has its headquarters. Going all the way up to Friendship and probably further up now because development is going all the way up to the docks. On the east side, that is how the west side would eventually be looking. That is how the west side would eventually be looking. And you know, the big picture is that there will always be a give and take situation. We have a real sector in Guyana called oil and gas. And Guyanese must benefit from that. But in order for the steel pile driving and the kinds of the better term is used, I think it's revetment, in, in order for that to be done, the trees got to be moved so that the machines could get in and get the work done. So that is something that is going to be ongoing once all of the designs and everything is agreed upon with the necessary inspections and the rest of it. And, 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 and let me just say, I've, since this matter has come to the public, I have spoken to the chairman of the City Defense Board, I've spoken to the secretary of the board, and I've spoken to the chief sea and river defense officer for them to advise me, to brief me, and to tell me what are the particular concerns that they have and what are the issues that need to be addressed. And they've all said to me, the adequacy of flood protection. And there is a commitment from us as ministers and a commitment from the board that any development at any show base, the adequacy of flood protection is a key factor and will be addressed at all times. And if during the construction phase something happens, well, then the developer will have to take the risk. An Esokeba man was on Sunday night killed by his brother after a Mother's Day celebration turned into a violent clash. That is 31-year-old Ganga Prasad, known as Tony of Fairfield, Esokeba Coast. According to reports, Tony was drinking with his two brothers, Chris and Munishwar Prasad. While drinking, an argument broke out between Chris and Tony. Chris reportedly slashed Tony to his head with a rum bottle during the argument, but was pushed away by their other brother, Munishwar, who lives on the island of Wakenham, but traveled to the Esukweba coast for the Mother's Day celebrations. After hitting his brother, Chris exited through the front door, and the victim made his way out through the back door. Police said Munishwar rushed to the front door and shouted that Tony was dead. Munishwar said he saw Tony in a pool of blood, with the blood coming from a wound to his left underarm. Munishwar and a neighbor then rushed the victim to the Saudi hospital, where he was pronounced dead. Chris ran away from the scene, but on Monday morning, his mother took him to the police, and he was placed in custody. When the newsroom returns, a police constable comes forward as the driver of the vehicle which killed a Better Hope man on a pedestrian crossing, and a video of Russians assaulting a Guyanese minor sparks investigations by three government ministries. If you're watching the newsroom. A police constable attached to the Mahaika police station has turned himself in as the driver in Saturday night's hit-and-run accident, which killed 50-year-old fisherman Navindra Ramnarain of Better Hope, East Coast Damarara. 
Police had reported that Ram Narayan was making his way across the road using the pedestrian crossing when motor pickup GPP 8699 struck him down. The pickup was being driven by the 24-year-old constable who turned himself in at the Brigdam police station on Sunday night. Ram Narayan was picked up in an unconscious condition by public-spirited citizens and rushed to the Georgetown Public Hospital where he was pronounced dead on arrival. Following the report of the accident, the owner of the vehicle, Ashton Barker of Norton Street Work in Ross Georgetown, went to the Brigdown Police Station at about 6 p.m. on Sunday. Just about 15 minutes later, the police constable walked into the station to acknowledge that he was the driver. The constable has been placed on the close arrest at the Sparendam East Coast Demerara Police Station as the investigations continue. The Ministries of Labour, Natural Resources and Home Affairs have launched an investigation after a clip of more than three minutes displayed an altercation between a Russian national and a Guyanese miner at a mining camp in Region 7. Some two minutes into the video, the Russian held the Guyanese miner in a chokehold, prompting his colleagues to intervene. Addressing the issue on Monday, Labour Minister Joseph Hamilton explained that the Russian national is attached to Innovative Mining Incorporated as a security guard. The mining operation, a joint venture between the Russians and the Guyanese, is located in Region 7, Kiyuni Mazaruni. The Labour Minister explained that the issue reportedly stemmed from allegations that the man seen being assaulted in the video was smuggling gold out of the mining camp. What was, was, was um, made available to us from Minister Barrett's sources is that this altercation stemmed from allegation of um, the person, uh, one of the employees, apparently seeking to smuggle um, gold out of um, this um, mining, mining, mining site. So, so that is the issue that created this altercation, as I understand it. The newsroom understands that the employee, a cook, was exiting the compound and was asked to subject himself to a search, as is the practice at the site. The newsroom further understands that someone had tipped off security that the cook was smuggling gold, which was later found in a bottle of what appeared to be skin cream. The gold was later melted and weighed 11.3 grams. The apparent altercation took place when the cook refused to be searched. According to the minister, the very Russian implicated in the video was involved in a similar incident where a minor was shot a few weeks ago. Further. The Labour Minister disclosed that his ministry had received a slew of complaints against the company regarding the breaching of labour laws. Before this um, videographic evidence of this confrontation, altercation, whatever you call it, I uh, received um, complaints about a company named Innovative Mining I was working somewhere in Region 7 and I have asked the, the, the Chief Labour Officer to write the company, summoning them uh, to a meeting here, I think it's tomorrow or Wednesday or someday, basically to deal with labour um, complaints and allegations, issues about not being overtime, issues about leave not given, and was those kinds of issues. The minister said too that a secondary investigation has been launched to ascertain who is conducting operations at the mining site. He explained to the newsroom that foreigners are only granted licenses for large-scale mining concessions and not medium or small scale. Hence, it is odd that Russian nationals are involved. A meeting has been summoned with the heads of the company, slated for Wednesday. For the newsroom... I am Shikima Day. A 55-year-old man was Sunday found dead on a beach on the island of Leguan after he left a family gathering to go swimming and fishing, police reported. Dead is Sihanouk Ramprasad of Better Hope, East Coast Damarara. Police said Ramprasad was visiting relatives at Success Leguan on Sunday. After drinking alcohol earlier in the day, Ramprasad left his relatives' his home just after 4 p.m. to go fishing and swimming at the beach nearby. When he didn't return after about two hours, relatives went looking for him. They first found his blue pants on the seawall, and as they looked further, they found Ramprasad floating face down. He was rushed to the Leguan Hospital, where he was pronounced dead on arrival. A post-mortem is expected to be conducted this week. 
The Attorney General and Minister of Legal Affairs, Anil Nandalal, has said that he is determined to ensure that the events surrounding the 2020 regional and general elections are never repeated. The assurance was offered as Nandalal clarified that government's work to ensure electoral reform is achieved before the 2025 election. Speaking to the newsroom shortly after, the United States Department announced its support for an 18-month project to strengthen the capacity of the Guyana Elections Commission. Regarding electoral processes, Attorney General and Minister of Legal Affairs Anil Nandlal says laws must also be put in place to sanction election officials should they compromise the system. Among the reforms is the creation of serious criminal offenses to guard against violations of the electoral process by persons who have been entrusted with its integrity, Nandlal said. Right now, the law does not focus on electoral officials committing wrongs. You see, the law presumes that the electoral process and machinery will be manned and staffed by people of integrity. We have seen in Guyana firsthand that that is a fallacy. Recounting the five-month protracted election that Guyana endured in 2020, Nandla said Guyanese have seen firsthand that it is the election officers who either compromised or attempted to compromise the system. It is against this backdrop that he has promised a range of offenses targeting those who man the election machinery and enjoys public trust. We have to create a constellation of offenses targeting those who enjoy the public trust and are put to man the machinery and then they violate that and burglarize that trust. They must be dealt with condignly by the law. So a series of offenses will be created to address that. Nadla said these new offenses will be put into law through the electoral reform process, will also target persons who do not work within the Ghana Elections Commission, but are found to be engaging, participating or being the intellectual authors of electoral fraud. Non-election officers who are either encouraging those election officers or are aiding and abetting them or are participating or are intellectually authoring their design within the system, those who are extrinsic of the system will also, once implicated and once they are found guilty, will be penalized heavily. The governing People's Progressive Party Civic has always maintained that several persons within GCOM colluded to rig the elections to keep the AP and UAFC in office. That led to a five-month-long delay in declaring the winner while political parties frequented the courts and were later, in, later involved in a national recount exercise. The Attorney General said as the government ramps up its efforts to achieve electoral reform ahead of the next elections, among the changes to be made to the law is for GCOM to be mandated to make the statements of polls public within a specified time. Nandlal assured that the reforms to be effective will not be in favor of any single political party. When the newsroom returns, the government continues the rollout of the initiative to grant 20,000 online scholarships. This is the newsroom. Senior Minister in the Office of the President with Responsibility for Finance, Dr. Ashni Singh, has said it is never too late to continue learning and upskilling in a plea to all the Guyanese to apply for one of the government's 20,000 online scholarships. The program is being facilitated through the Guyana Online Academy of Learning goal. The minister made the statement during an outreach at the Cotton Tree Primary School on Saturday. Because we want the entire Guyanese workforce to be equipped with the skills that are needed by all of these new and emerging opportunities in our rapidly growing economy. That was Senior Minister in the Office of the President with Responsibility for Finance, Dr. Ashni Singh, addressing attendees of the Gold Scholarship Outreach at the Cotton Tree Primary School. The minister said a person's age does not limit his or her ability to learn a new subject or acquire a new skill. He also noted that while the government places much emphasis on the development of youth, anyone can capitalize on the opportunity to apply for a Gold Scholarship. Not just about the workforce having the skills that is need that are needed but we feel very strongly about individual Guyanese being able to acquire education and skills to uplift themselves we want to create those opportunities but it is up to you to seize those opportunities that is why this program 
is as important as it is because it is critical not only to our overall economic production and productivity, but it is critical to you in your respective households. It is critical to you uplifting yourselves educationally and economically. Minister explained that Guyana is primed to undergo significant economic transformation, but it cannot happen without education and the upgrading of persons' skill sets. He said this principle is the driving force behind the PPPC government's delivery of the Gold Scholarship Program. Additionally, he said this is the reason that the government is hosting the outreaches in every community to ensure that every citizen is informed of the scholarship and is afforded an opportunity to apply. In this regard, the minister noted that Goal is not a standalone program but complements investments being made to enhance the delivery of education in schools, institutes and at the university. He also noted that the government is working towards achieving universal secondary education at the end of its first term. Meanwhile, Region 5 Vice Chairman Ryan Peters hailed the PPPC government for fulfilling its promise to Guyanese to deliver thousands of scholarships. He told attendees that the government is keen on investing in their growth and well-being. Also present was Region 5 Member of Parliament Faisal Jafarali, Region 5 Chairman Vic Chand Ramphal, and Regional Education Officer Dion Lynn Lewis Clark also attended the outreach. Over the past few weeks, Ministers of Government have fanned out across the country to ensure all citizens are informed about the goal program. The scholarships program is a joint venture by the Ministries of Education and public service. 25 young participants of the government's Youth and Natural Resources program were on Monday given an in-depth look at Guyana's extractive industry at a workshop facilitated by the Guyana Mining School and Training Centre, a body corporate of the Guyana Geology and Mines Commission. A group of 25 fresh mines were encouraged to dig into Guyana's extractive industry after being given an in-depth look into the sector at a training workshop facilitated by the Guyana Geology and Mines Mining School and Training Center Inc. Held at the Regency Hotel on Monday, those handpicked to partake in government's Youth in Natural Resources Apprenticeship Program were treated to short sessions detailing key parts of the extractive sector, like occupational health and safety, petroleum exploration basics, map reading, and GPS navigation. Brief remarks were delivered by the Deputy Permanent Secretary of the Natural Resource Ministry, Vishal Ambedkar. He said that the program affords students the chance not only to become prospective workers in the sector, but to become investors as well. Over the years, we've seen that government has been working to ensure that our natural resources are developed, whether it's gold, diamond, bauxite, or new, newly found petroleum industry, government continues to work hard to ensure that our resources are developed. You being here today is demonstration of that commitment by government once again in ensuring that our resources are developed. And so, they've invested in our greatest natural resource, our human resource. Meanwhile, Commissioner of the GGMC, Newell Dennison, in his remarks, said that the workshop aims to provide a link for the extractive sector's next generation to build and help sustain it for the years to come. As the fourth cohort of youth and natural resources, I can assure you that you are going to experience some significant and very life-changing events which in many ways will bring context and understanding of the tradition, the long-standing tradition that we in Guyana have taken and have been using as a critical aspect of our survival economically and socially. The Youth in Natural Resources program is one that gives young people the opportunity to experience Guyana's interior regions, learn about the natural resources sector, and access job opportunities in the sector. 
the participants will travel through Guyana's rainforest to mining camps in regions 2 and 7 to see for themselves how precious and semi-precious minerals are extracted from the earth and also to interact with professionals to learn about the experiences of those working in the extractive industry, including the oil and gas sector. For the newsroom, I am Shakima Day. Residents of several villages in regions 5 and 6 on Saturday welcomed the government's online scholarship initiative. Minister of Human Services and Social Security Dr. Vindya Prasad visited No. 76 village, Skeldon and Yakusari on the quarantine and Bat Settlement, West Coast Burbis, to inform residents about the program. In a passionate plea for young people and women to apply for one of the 20,000 online scholarships, Minister of Human Services and Social Security Dr. Vindya Prasad has outlined how the initiative stands to empower people from all across the country. The minister explained that the Goal Initiative targets Guyanese 18 years and older. She said the scholarship program is inclusionary as it caters for early school leavers and professionals. A six-month bachelor's preparatory program has also been designed for persons who do not have the requisite qualifications to qualify themselves before pursuing the scholarship program of their choice. Minister Prasad also encouraged both vendors and consumers at the Skeldon market to apply for the scholarship. I'm very passionate about young people and women being empowered. I, I'm a big believer that once you give people an opportunity, be it education or be it somewhere where they can move from a state of dependence to a state of independence, you have taught a person to not be always waiting for a handout. You're teaching them to help themselves. Additionally, Minister Prasad encouraged women to take advantage of the ministry's flagship program, Women's Innovation and Investment Network, WIN. WIN caters for women and girls from 13 years and older. It offers 20 courses in areas such as information and communication technology, and graphics, decor and design, professional care, beauty and wellness, hospitality and administration. Life is, life is a funny thing. Sometimes opportunities are there, we don't see them. Sometimes we see them, we don't seize them. And sometimes we don't seize them, and we don't use them. So we miss them. So now here are opportunities right here for you. Hold them, hold on tight, and make the best of it, right? And let's win together. Dr. Prasad said it is vital for all women in Ghana to be independent as it will contribute significantly to nation building. At Bath Settlement, West Coast Burbese, aspiring entrepreneurs were pleased that government recognized the disparity in training opportunities for men and women and is seeking to ensure equitable access. For the WIN initiative, classes will be held online or in classrooms with no more than 30 persons. Minister Prasad noted each course would also include sessions on the Sexual Offences and Domestic Violence Act. 50 mothers at the West Demerara and Georgetown Public Hospitals on Sunday received hampers from the Office of the First Lady, Mrs. Arya Ali. The distribution of the hampers was organized by staff of the hospitals. In a statement, the First Lady said the journey of motherhood can be an incredibly challenging one and requires support every step of the way from family, friends and even strangers. She said she was happy to partner with Money Schwartz Limited on the initiative. We are very much grateful here at West Demara Regional Hospital that considerations are given to our mothers. We know even at um, right now during the pandemic, things are difficult and these hampers, they go far away in assisting our mothers um, to attend to their baby and the family as a whole. So on this day, Mother's Day, we are grateful that the First Lady can consider um, our mothers within this region and I'm sure they are very much appreciated of it. So at the moment, we have four postnatal patients. These are mothers that have already delivered, um, and we have two prenatal patients. Mothers awaiting delivery. So these hampers will be distributed to the postnatal mothers of our, war, our unit um, on behalf of the Office of the First Lady. Uh, it's because it's Mother's Day, and uh, even though they're not first-time mothers, I mean, it's just this special feeling of being appreciated for giving birth. So it's just to give back, saying thank you for adding to our society and <laughs> bringing them forth. When the newsroom returns, the financial weather and bridge reports along with sport.
Welcome back. This is the newsroom. It's time for sport. Guyanese Carsten Harris made a memorable debut in the UFC, winning his contest against American Christian Aguilera by submission in the opening round on Saturday evening. While he reveled in the joy of victory, he told the world his beginning was in no way easy. Akim Green has the story. Harris, a welterweight, won the fight 2 minutes and 52 seconds into the first round at UFC Vegas 26. With the result, Harris is now on a four-fight winning streak and 9-1 in his past 10 bouts. Prior to joining the UFC, Harris was competing in notable promotions such as Shooto Brazil and Brave FC. Reaching to the global stage is not easy since the 30-year-old from Skill and Burbies indicated at a post-match press conference that during his early days in Guyana, he would not have meals at times to carry to school. His sister, Vanella Harris, speaking in Newsroom Sports, said, We can't be any proud of Carlston. We expected nothing less from him because this is his dream come true. He works so hard every day and night, and his discipline to the sport is incredible. He deserves all of this. He has worked for this, and no doubt he will continue to do so throughout his career. End quote. I grew up in a poor family, you know, some day, some day, you know, we woke up, we no meal to eat, nothing, go to school, sometimes no meal, and I grew up in a single um, parent's home, you know, my mom, you know, she work as a, like a housemaid, yeah, so, yeah, man, I get into this, you know, to change my life and change my family life, you know, yeah, I feel great. Harris defended a takedown by snapping Aguilera down, locked in the choke and sat back to put Aguilera out. Harris picked up the win with an underconda choke, making him just the 19th fight in UFC history to win with that finish. In my gym, we train a lot of submission, yeah. Um, we train a lot of livery, and the lot of livery, you know, we train a lot of underconda choke, you know. So I know that anytime he give me any opportunity, I would get this choke. When you got it, did you know immediately, like, yeah, he's going to sleep? When, when I got it, you know, I feel it was tight. I, I said, there is no how he could get out of this, but you know, I was waiting on the on the um, ref because the ref told me back in the locker room that no, let me, just when I touch you, you let go. So I was abiding by the rules. Harris, who's based in Brazil, started martial arts in 2011 and stated he was inspired by BJ Penn, who defeated Diego Sanchez to join the UFC. His advice to other young athletes seeking to make a name is to believe in themselves. Practice sports and um, believe in yourself, believe in your dream, you know, walk towards your dream. One day it will happen, but you have to believe in yourself. The fighter said he will await a medical clearance before knowing when he again he will enter the octagon, since he felt he might have injured his rib while going to make the take for the submission. For the newsroom, Akim Green. Cricket West Indies Chief Selector Roger Harper has been elected to serve for the next two years as president of his childhood club, Demerara Cricket Club. The former West Indies cricketer and coach who held the set position after the 2018 elections was re-elected on a post when the Queenstown-based club held its election of officers on May 4th. Lawrence Smith, who previously served as second vice president, was elected as the first vice president, while Patrick Harding now takes up the role as second vice president. Additionally, Colin Alfred is now secretary, while Dennis Squares continues in his role as club captain. Lyndon Light takes over the role of indoor captain and veteran journalist Adam Harris continues as public relations officer. The position of treasurer and assistant secretary treasurer are temporarily vacant due to no one accepting the nomination. However, at the next meeting, those positions are expected to be filled. The committee members are Troy Halley, Mahindra Jaikaran, Rudolf Callender, Reginald Brotherson and Mark Harper. President of the Athletics Association of Guyana, Aubrey Hudson, indicated that realistically the association is confident it can send at least six to eight athletes to the South American Championships in Ecuador later this month. More in this Akeem Green report. Ideally, Hudson hopes to send all 12 of the shortlisted athletes, but a short notice of change in host nation may limit the amount of funds they acquire. Therefore, the priority is on who the AAG believes stand the strongest possibility of qualifying for the Olympic Games this year. The shortlisted team comprises of Winston George, Cormel Prince, Jeremy Bascom, Emmanuel Archibald, Akeem Stewart, Arenzi Chance, Devon Barrington, Andrea Foster, Ali Abrams and Jasmine Abrams. 
a manager and coach will also travel when the team is finalized. Hudson told Newsroom Sport on Monday that Olympic qualification certainly is priority, but they are also looking to keep an eye on athletes for the Commonwealth Games and World Championships in 2022. In preparing a budget, because remember we are on very short notice, in preparing a budget, I have to take all the variables into consideration. Mm -hmm. What I am almost certain may have to happen is that some of the athletes uh, may have to provide their own funding to get to these championships. Those that we um, may not necessarily think may make the standards as against those who we know sh that if given an opportunity will make the standards for the Olympics. I still think that we're looking at at least six, six to, between six to eight athletes. I mean, I, I am really and truly shooting for the 12 plus manager and coach. Um, but uh, I think, um, you know, between six to eight of them um, should really and truly push hard to ensure that they get there. But again, you know, council will have to sit and decide on that. The championships were initially stated to be held from May 14th to the 16th in Argentina. What was moved due to the spike in COVID-19 cases and now will be held from May 29th to the 31st in Ecuador. Hudson Ford indicated that track and field is a performance-based sport and the AAG will continue to invest in those who are improving credibly. A track and field is performance-based and um, I don't necessarily look at age um, but what I look at is, is your performance and if if you go out there and you make the time, regardless of your age, then you're entitled to go once you qualify. So in making the investment, if Winston George is, is still running fast and still the national fastest athlete um, at 400 meters, still making our qualifying standards, um, we have an obligation to ensure that Winston George gets to those games and not necessarily um, try to, to say, okay, no, we're not going to send Winston, we're going to send a young athlete who are not making the standards. For me, if you want to go ahead of Winston George, and I'm just using this as an example, then you need to be running faster than Winston George. The AAG will seek support from the government of Guyana, the Guyana Olympic Association, corporate Guyana, and the calendar funding from World Athletics to fund this trip. The championships were last held in Lima, Peru in May 2019. Team Guyana comprised of Devon Barrington, Akeem Stewart, Winston George, Gianna McCammon, and Leslie Beard. For the newsroom, Akeem Green. Long-standing supporter of bodybuilding in Guyana, Fitness Express has once again pledged support to the Guyana Bodybuilding and Fitness Federation, GBBFF, for its novices' championships to be held virtually in Linden on Saturday, May 29th at the Lycius Hall. President of GBFF, Kivon Bess, expressed immense gratitude for the entity's continued and overwhelming support over the years. Jamie MacDonald, the proprietor of the John and Sheriff Street's business entity, said it is important to invest in sport, especially events like these, which honor the future talents. Approximately 25 athletes are set to take the stage for the Federation's first event for 2021, and they will compete in three different segments, namely bodybuilding, Miss Bikini, and men's physique. According to the GBBFF, athletes, backstage personnel, and executives will all have to observe all COVID-19 protocols. In tonight's feature, we highlight the success story of a young lady whose post-pregnancy weight forced her along a path of health and fitness. Today, the lean, strong and confident lass has stepped into competitive strength sport, even while fulfilling her foremost role as a mother and committing to a full-time job. Avinash Ramzan caught up with her recently. Hi, I'm Salma Haq. I'm a Key Kong sales representative for Valley For You and a mother of a 10-year-old boy, but I'm so much more than that. Indeed, Salma Haq is much more than a mother and a career woman. In fact, her current journey, a quite interesting one, started from attaining motherhood as she gained almost 30 pounds. The trouble came when she looked at herself in the mirror. The person she saw was not the person she wanted to be. No, it is very hard to most women, I think, to look at yourself from being you know, really, really toned to seeing so much loose skin and, you know, marks and stuff like that. You just don't love yourself anymore. Did it mess with you mentally? Yes, it did. It did. I was always this at a skinny girl. So I was looking, you know, out of shape to my, in my arm. Um, yeah. 
post pregnancy. So I wanted to lose the weight. So I joined the gym. Six years ago, I would have said, I don't want to do weights. I didn't want to do weights, period, because I said, I will look bulky, I will look like a man, but that is, that is not true. I mean, I'm, I, do I look like a man? <laughs> no. Following weight loss gym training post-pregnancy, Salma embarked on CrossFit training in 2015 and the different movements, coupled with a concerted effort to always improve on times, was a challenge she embraced. CrossFit has been my baby since 2015. I love CrossFit. The only thing that where we in Guyana don't have is a gymnastic coach and I think that is where cross with kind of um, borderlines because you, you can't elevate yourself farther in that unless you're self, self -taught, teaching yourself, right? And so I wanted to some, do something different. In November 2020, Salma came into contact with Championship Secretary of the Ghana Amateur Powerlifting Federation, Martin Webster, who has been supervising her entry into powerlifting. In March 2021, she participated in the National Novice and Junior Championship, winning the 57 kg class in her maiden competition. So I'm more thirsty where the weights are concerned. I think that I have the potential to carry a, a lot of weights and he saw the potential in me, but I was never that confident. But now I'm looking to get way bigger weights than I did before. When you're doing weights and you get a PR, like I did on competition, you now want to know what your next PR is going to be like. And you are like anxious to get that. You're excited, you want it. Now, short term goal, first of all, we have intermediates coming up in three, in, uh, three months. And I want her to lift as intermediates and eventually become a national lifter. Uh, she's been bitten by the iron bug, so I have to catch the iron while it's hot. And I'm quite sure at her weight class, she will excel. Webster initially focused on strength training and improving Salma's technique as he drew on his years of experience to fine tune his client. The first thing I did was say, look, um, I think I need you to wear a belt. Um, it's not so much as to protect your back, it's more of for you to generate more power, uh, something we call in strength training called intra-abdominal pressure. So in putting the, the belt on, she immediately noticed that, whoa, this is totally different from the way I lifted. And we progressed from there. Um, her ability to do a very good front squat, which is part of the Olympic lifts, and in looking at that, the amount of weight that she, that she lifted, I knew right away with just a bit of technique change that she can be a very good uh, back squatter and would develop her front squat even better because uh, she was stuck at a, at a level that she wasn't progressing and it had to do with technique and of course physical strength and one of the things is that you have to get general strength to be able to progress in just about any of the other lifts. So we just made a small change and then started to proceed to doing back squats which is the low bar back squat which is something we use in strength training and powerlifting. According to the World Health Organization, unhealthy diets and physical inactivity are key risk factors for the major non-communicable diseases such as cardiovascular diseases, cancer and diabetes. For Salma, a strict nutrition plan has been a major part of her success story as she charters a course of health and well-being. Before my son actually, I ate anything I wanted. But after my son, when I tried that habit, I gained even more weight. And then in 2017, I found this site on Instagram, it's the RP fitness site, and they would, well, they gave us a plan. So I started to fo follow that plan, and for six months, I was 100% strict on just uh, dial-in nutrition plan that they would give to me personally. 
and it changed my world entirely. Like I would know how much to eat, when to eat, how much to eat after a workout, before a workout, when I think I can have a free meal or not. I'm not 100% strict anymore. On weekends, I would have at least two free meals each day. So on uh, during the week, I know that I'm working for something at the end of the week. So just be a bit relaxed, not too binge in. I would look back at my old pictures, which I try to save as much as possible from 2015. I tell myself, I don't want to go back down to this road or look like this person again. In fact, I just want to keep bettering myself and seeing a better version of myself on a daily basis. That's our broadcast this evening. I'm Neil Marks. Take care. Remember, you can get the latest breaking news and sport at newsroom.gy.